Jonathan, when you are studying consciousness, um, how do you define the kinds of information or data that you're looking for? What are the kinds of questions that you ask so that you can get in information from the experiment or from the environment that feeds your understanding of consciousness? Well, as you know, consciousness is very slippery and, and challenging to measure. And so the approach that we've taken is to try to triangulate on it, to rely uh, simultaneously on people's self-reports, on their behaviors, and on their physiological measures. And by using all three uh -huh. together, that allows us to really uh, move the progress. Mm. So uh, let's take one example, which is mind wandering. Uh, for a long time, people thought that mind wandering was very difficult to study because it's entirely this internal quality and, and how, do you, how do you get a handle on it? But what we do is we have people engage in a task, say a, a boring vigilance task, where they have to press a button every time they see uh, a, any number except the number three. And if, they, if the number three appears, they have to withhold the response. And we then ask that we ping them periodically and we go, just now was your uh, mind wandering. And then we can see whether or not they report if they were mind wandering or not. And then we can also relate whether or not they say they were mind wandering to their um, Behavior. behavioral performance. Yeah. Did they, are they more likely to make a mistake when they were mind wandering versus when they were not? And we can also relate it to various different characteristics, physiological measures. Hmm. And by triangulating on those three different aspects, we're able to make uh, real progress in sort of understanding when they're mind wandering, when they're not mind wandering, and what are the characteristics of a mind wandering brain relative to a non mind wandering brain. Uh, you talk about a distinction between uh, unconscious, conscious, and metaconscious. Uh, how does that impact the, the data that you look at? Well, so the example of mind wandering really, I think, powerfully illustrates this three level yeah, yeah. Uh, distinction. So, uh, say, one of my favorite examples when you're reading, we all have the experience of reading and suddenly realizing that we're mind wandering, that we're not paying attention right. to what we're reading right. at all. Right. And in that situation, you can see the three levels. So when you're reading and mind wandering, much of the words that you're seeing are only unconsciously being processed because you're thinking about something completely unrelated. So a lot of the actual content is just being processed at the unconscious level. The conscious level is the experience of mind wandering. Well, yeah. You're thinking about lunch or whatever it is yeah. that you're mind wandering right. about. And then metaconsciousness is actually missing for a while, but then you have that moment, oh, I've been mind wandering. And that moment of realizing the content of your mind, that is, uh, meta-awareness. And so uh, what this suggests is the reason why we mind wander so often while we're reading is we lose track of the contents of our own mind. We're mind wandering, uh, but we don't realize that we're mind wandering. Yeah, we have self-awareness is, is uh, meta, meta. Well, meta-awareness or meta-consciousness is related to self-awareness, but it's very specifically about recognizing the current contents of your uh -huh. mind, uh -huh. where self-awareness maybe you might be feeling self-conscious about something or, or, or just sort of... Right. Oh. introspecting but not you could even be engaging in this self-aware oh I'm you know I'm doing all these things wrong and not even realizing yeah, that you're doing it so you're, yeah. you're having this moment of self-awareness in the total absence of meta-awareness <laughs> right, right so uh, what what type of data do you, can you get from that that reflect on the deep nature of consciousness um, one way that we get at this is we uh, have individuals say reading and then uh, periodically we probe them uh, and ask them uh, if they were mind wandering at that particular time. But we also ask them to self-report every time that they notice oh, that oh, they're mind wandering. Okay. So we have two different measures oh, now nice. of uh, mind wandering. When they self-catch, that is an example of meta-awareness because they just <laughs> went, oh geez, I did it again. Yeah. But if we can catch them before they've caught themselves, then that shows that they weren't aware that they were mind wandering. And that gives us uh, sort of the inside track on the mind wandering that's happening without meta-awareness. And what we find is that there's some real differences between mind wandering with meta-awareness versus mind wandering without meta-awareness. You mean the character of the mind wandering that's itself? The, well, the character of the mind wandering and also its impact. When people are oh. mind wandering and they don't realize that they're mind wandering, it's much more disruptive. And this makes sense because uh, you, if you realize that you're mind wandering, you can sort of adjust and go back and so on. Right. But if it's going under the radar, it's going to be much more disruptive. So by distinguishing between the aware mind wandering and the unaware mind wandering. We can get a, a, a much better handle both on the nature of mind wandering and also on the nature of meta-awareness. 
Um, you've uh, pioneered uh, thinking on the decline effect in, in psychological studies of, of, of a, a large number of categories. Uh, does the decline effect have any um, significance in terms of our experimental approach to consciousness, in terms of uh, undermining theories that may look robust but are really not? Well, it's important when we talk about the decline effect to recognize that there are many different reasons why decline effects could take place. And as we've discussed, uh, many studies uh, fail to replicate, and there are lots of different reasons for that. And there are a lot of very uh, conventional explanations for the decline effect, and I think that, that chances are that everything that happens with respect to the decline effect can be accounted for by these types of things. For example, if somebody uh, runs a study and if it doesn't have a great amount of power, there's a good chance it won't work. But if it does work, they had to have gotten a little bit lucky because they didn't really have enough power to make it work. So what this means is that a lot of studies that worked, especially ones that were underpowered, they worked because there was something there and they got a bit lucky, the chip sort of fell their way. Yeah. When people attempt to replicate that study, there's no reason to expect that they'll be as lucky and so regression to the mean, they'll get a, a smaller effect. Also, uh, people may not do exactly the same protocol and that may lead to reductions in effects. There may be biases of one sort or the other. So there are all sorts of really very conventional explanations for it. But I, I have speculated, and I, I, I say this uh, somewhat uh, cautiously, very cautiously, that there might be something more to it. I don't know for a fact that it isn't possible that somehow the act of observation itself contributes to the decline effect. I've speculated this in a, in a paper in uh, Nature that, that somehow there's sort of a beginner's luck when we're onto a good track that, that things go especially well at first. And this may have something to do with the act of observation. Uh, this would suggest that there could be something parapsychological actually in the scientific method itself. I, I certainly wouldn't bet on this, but I don't think we can rule it out.